in life, the hidden meanings in mythology, simply sums up a very important point. The Apostle Paul was right. You cannot take the Bible <clears throat> or any of these other ancient documents literally because they're telling you a story of you. They're using symbolic words in order to convey a deep spiritual truth. The book of Revelation, how much has it revealed to anybody? And yet, hidden within the book of Revelation, with all of its allegories and numerology and mysticism, the book of Revelation is filled with Hinduism. It's filled with things from the ancient Kabbalah. It's filled with Buddhism. It's filled with numerology. It's filled with astrology, zodiac references all over the place. And yet people come up and try to read it literally, and what they've sold us all of these years is there is a god somewhere who is sitting up on some planet plotting a nuclear holocaust against the planet Earth, and he's going to give Russia bombs to bomb Israel, and this madness that we, we live in fear waiting for the Earth to burn up. <coughs> well, be at good cheer doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that at all. It's mysticism. It deceives those who do, who do not meditate into thinking these things, and they're so far away from God. But when they obey Jesus Christ and practice the single eye by entering within and going up into the bliss of meditation above human thought, you find the truth. And the truth is that Armageddon is the fire or the spirit which comes down from heaven, which is the higher mind, to purge away all of those thoughts from the lower mind and set you free. Isn't that great? Isn't that great to know God's not planning a nuclear holocaust, as we're taught by born-again Christians? Look, in order to follow the book of Revelation, you need your chart. Now, this chart has on it the seven churches of the book of Revelation, which line up with the seven chakras of the human body, of the spine, the seven nerve centers, which line up with the seven signs and the seven planets and so forth. And they tell you the aspects of the body, the various aspects of the body. The book of Revelation is about you. It's about your body. The master builder of the temple of the book of Revelation is the pituitary gland of the brain, the master gland of the body. Now, you can have this chart, and uh, all you do is give us a call, and we'll send it to you, 609 9710537, and it's yours. There's no charge, obviously. But it'll tell you what each church in the book of Revelation relates to what body part, what sign, what planet, the symbol like sex, desire, feelings, anger, and so forth. And you can have it just by saying, hey, send me the, send me the Revelation chart, and we'll send it to you. Okay? We're at Revelation 3, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And if you're ready to roll along, let's take a look at this mysterious document and see what it's telling us, because it's telling us how to deal with ourselves. Revelation 3, verse 1, Under the angel of the church at Sardis, write these things, say he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, the church at Sardis, if you had your chart, you'd find that that is the uh, fourth chakra from the bottom. It is the throat chakra. It corresponds with the sign Virgo. Its symbol is communication, and the planet is Mercury. You have to understand, the whole aspect of sevens in the Bible and sevens in ancient mysticism was built around the seven planets that the people of the ancient times could see. That's all they could do was see seven. And so all of that which came spiritually was predicated on those seven planets, so everything in the Bible is in sevens. Now, Sardis is the place of the throat, and the reason that Sardis was given the position of the church at the throat is because in Sardis, they were famous for what was known as a Sardian stone, which resembled an Adam's apple of the throat. That's how all of these things came to be. Isn't that interesting? And it's true. So if you had your chart, you'll know it. So it says, the angel of the church of Sardis, <clears throat> these things say, he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And of course, we're talking again about the seven chakras. The seven nerve centers that come from the base of the spine up to the pineal gland, okay? And that number seven, that number seven in mysticism means divine intervention. Do you ever watch these guys on television, these evangelists, and they say, well, there's going to be seven years tribulation and seven... That's not what it means. I mean, is that what kind of a god, what kind of a mad fiend is this that's going to send seven years tribulation on everybody? For what? What do we do? I mean, you know... Wow, you did all of this sinning. I, I didn't do anything. 
I mean, I just showed up. I, I, I did not get the mind. I didn't order the mind that I have. You didn't order the mind that you have. Who can blame you? If, you got, if some guy's got some mind that's screwed up, how can you blame a person for acting out on the basis of the mind that they were given at birth? So, I mean, what did we do? Say, what did we do? Think about that. And so then, if you're going to get seven years of tribulation, some god somewhere is going to bang you in the head for something that you couldn't do anything about anyhow because of the thoughts that you received in your mind through the carnal mind that you didn't order in the first place. It doesn't mean that. It means during the time that you have tribulation in your life, there will be seven, divine intervention. There will be seven, peace. There will be seven, a Sabbath, a place of rest, which is the seventh spot on the chakra chain, which is the place of the crown, the pineal gland of the brain, which lights up the right hemisphere of the brain, okay? Okay, so that's he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, and we're talking about those seven chakras. Now look what it says here. I know your works, and you have a name that lives and are dead. That's an interesting phrase to take a look at, isn't it? You have a name that lives and are dead. What could that be? See, this is the area of the throat, you see. Now remember, every aspect of Revelation is about your human body. It's about your mind, it's about the glands of your body, it's about the, the immune system of your body, the endocrine system of your body, that's what it's about. It has nothing to do with these things outside, or these evangelists have tried to scare you about. It doesn't mean that at all. It's talking about your body. And this is the area of the throat, it's the area of the voice. See, you, in other words, you have a name, in other words, you have a way. See, it, it, when you see the word name in, in the Bible, it doesn't mean name like Joe Blow, it means way, the way you do things. You have a way, okay, that lives and are dead. In other words, what this is saying is you speak very religious things. Your sounds are very convincing. Your words seem alive with spirit. The words that you use sometimes seem very inspirational, but you're dead. See? You, 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 the way you carry about yourself looks very religious, and you deceive a lot of people into thinking you know what you're talking about, but inside you're dead. It's the same thing as the fig tree that we covered last week, remember? Here Jesus comes along and he sees this tree, and it's got leaves on it. It looks very healthy, but it's not producing any fruit. What's going on? Because inside it's dead. On the outside, Jesus compared people like this with, with the tombs in the old days in Jerusalem. They used to whitewash the tombs. And he says, you're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you look pretty and white and clean, but inside you're filled with old dead men's bones. In other words, you, you speak religion. You sing hymns. You've got stained glass, and all of this thing is very religious. You've got Bibles big enough to choke a mule, but inside you're dead. When you get alone, you're in that same old desperate situation of loneliness. You have at your quiet time, that mind speaking to you, putting doubts in your head, putting fears in your head, putting distress in your head. You know, it's easy to go to church and talk religion in front of people, but when you're by yourself and you, you have to turn the door to that, that house and it's quiet and, 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 and inside you're all alone again, you find out that what, what, what are you really getting? What, what are you getting other than an hour in church for a euphoric emotional demonstration? What are you getting as far as a change in your own life and a certainty and a truth, you know? Nothing. It says, you look alive, but you're dead. <clears throat> Revelation 3, 3 says, <clears throat> it says, um, be Revelation 3, 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Now, there's a good line. Okay. Be watchful and straith strengthen the things that remain and are ready ready to die. What in the world is he talking about? The things that remain. In Hebrews 12, 27, the Apostle Paul says, those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So here's the identity then of the book of Revelation saying the things strengthen the things that remain. And the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 12, 27 says, those things which cannot be shaken may remain. The only things inside of you which cannot be shaken are spirit realms that exist above the thoughts of your mind. Anytime there is a thought in your mind, it can be shaken. 
any thought you have can be shaken. You can be put on a guilt trip. You can be put in fear. You can be put in depression. You can be put into a, a nervous breakdown by the thoughts that come from yourself, the thoughts that come from other people. But when you lift yourself above the thoughts of the human mind into a higher realm of consciousness where there is no thought, it cannot be shaken. Because where there is no thought, there's no ego. Where there is no thought, there's no fear. Where there is no thought, there's no anger. Where there is no thought, there is no depression. And so that is what the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 6.1 calls perfection, meditation. When you bring yourself into a place of meditation, you raise your consciousness above the thoughts of the mind. That's the single eye. You then can go into a chant of Om. You can go Nam Myo Ho Renge Ki Om Mani Padme Om. Whatever. It confuses your mind. It sets you free and allows you to go up into a higher realm where Christ dwells. And there where there are no human thoughts, that is what can remain and will not be shaken. Anything else will be destroyed. And, and you know it. I mean, sometimes you've, you've got everything figured out. You know, even, did you ever, you know, you're going to go to the Bahamas for a vacation. You're going to go to Florida for a vacation just to get away from it all. And what do you do? You get down on the beach. You get your blanket set. You're looking out at the sailboats. And right away, you start worrying about something. Oh, I wonder if everything's okay at home. I wonder if the kids, I wonder if they remember to feed the dog. And your mind will never leave you alone. That's why meditation has to be a vital, continual thing. That's why Jesus says, watch, 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 and strengthen those things that remain. In other words, work on making that higher mind above the thoughts of the lower mind stronger. Okay? So it's the inner kingdom. It's the, when you talk about the things that remain, when you talk about the dwelling place of God within you, you're talking about the cosmic presence of God. Oh, yeah, you know, we, we all love, I mean, you want to be an American and God bless America and all this business. When you get to a point of aligning yourself with the cosmic universal God, you then have to be a citizen of the universe. You have to be one with the world. You have to be one with all. You, you can't say, oh, oh God, bring our boys home. You have to say, bring American boys home, bring the Iraqi boys home, bring all the boys home to their parents because God is no respecter of person and the universal God is not choosing uh, choosing any nationality so that way you have to then come into a oneness with the universe and be one with everybody now that's hard for a lot of people because religious denominations are built on pride and ego people will fight you about that they'll i mean you see it all over the world and ever since you've been alive there's always been wars and most of them are fought over religion because it's ego it's pride and it's antichrist okay let me just pause for a moment to tell you that uh, I'm really happy to have you with us and the Christian Village Church at 134 Route 9 in Forked River in New Jersey, right next to Mrs. Walker's ice cream parlor. And on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. I teach uh, the hidden meanings of Jesus Christ. At Sunday evenings at 7.30 p.m. I teach the book of Revelation and we're starting a series on Hare Krishna and Jesus Christ. Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. we have meditation and that's a beautiful time. See, Friday evening, I teach the Zodiac and the Bible, the Bible that was written in the stars long before it was put on paper. And you, we'd love to have you come down. We have a telephone that is open. And if you'd like to call and get information, I'll give you the phone number. It's 609-971-0537. 609-971-0537. There's an answering machine there, and we'll send you information. We'll send you, you know, information about different things that we have and can share with you. 609-971-0537. Um, we also have a, a, a video network, a television network, in which if you're interested, uh, you can call and say, I want the video network, and we'll send you uh, absolutely free uh, v VCR tapes once a month, and uh, they'll show you the, the live services from the church. So those of you who can't uh, come to the church, if, if you'd like to do that, it's no cost, no charge connected with it. All you have to do is promise to send them on to the next person. 609-971-0537. And you can just leave your name and address with the answering machine. We'll send you the information. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So here it says then, Be careful, watchful, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Okay? For I have not found your works perfect before God. Now, here's the Bible telling you, you've got to be perfect. <clears throat> I have not found your works perfect. How do you become perfect? Somebody says, I can't be perfect. Yes, you can. Very easy to become perfect. How do you become perfect? Take no thought. 
When you enter into divine meditation and you separate from the thoughts of your mind, you are in perfection. Absolute, total perfection. Where there is no stain of thought, you have what is called virgin consciousness. And in a virgin consciousness is where the Christ can be born. See? So that's why it says here, I have not found your works perfect, because what are you doing? You're going to the church social, you're going to the Bible study, you're going to the prayer group, you're going to church three or four days a week, you're saying the prayers, you're singing in the choir, but you have not touched the place of perfection, which is the higher mind, which is the divine consciousness, and you've not gone near there. And so that your works are not found to be perfect. And, and the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 6.1 says, Now leaving the doctrines, uh, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection. In other words, let us leave all of these symbols of baptisms and all of that stuff and go on to perfection, which is divine meditation into the higher realm. You know, it's an interesting thing. <clears throat> when you talk about the Apostle Paul, uh, he is nothing like we've been taught or, or, or we, you know, the kind of things we conjure up in our mind. In Acts 18, the Apostle Paul runs into a strange man who's out of mythology. His name is Dionysius. Dionysius. Dionysius was of a group of the Nazarenes that practice the uh, meditation and demonstrated on the outside by shaving their hair off of their head. What they felt was that hair was a symbol of the growth of the thoughts of the lower mind. And so they would shave themselves bald and they would take a vow now that they were going to be separated from the things of the lower mind and enter into divine meditation. In Acts 18 it says the Apostle Paul shaved his head because he had made a vow after he met Dionysius. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul with his robe on and his bald head and a little flower in his hand going down the street? I mean, the churches today throw him out. They throw him out. Oh, he's, he must be in a cult. He's got a bald head and he's wearing a robe and he's coming down saying, repent. <laughs> he must be a Hare Krishna. But that's what the Apostle Paul looked like. And if you look at Acts 21, it said the Apostle Paul took four other guys who wanted to be his disciples down to the temple and shaved their heads. So you couldn't be a follower of the Apostle Paul unless you shaved your head. So you got your shaved head and your orange robe and you're chanting Nam Yoho Ringe Keo going up the street and everybody thinks, uh, you know, they're calling you Paul and they think you're a born-again Christian and you're anything but. Say. In, in the realm or the way of thinking that the Apostle Paul thought in the way we think, totally different. Now, that's, that's an interesting thing because there's not too many Christians realize how deeply involved in mysticism Paul was. And, and, and the Apostle Paul said in Hebrews 10.19, you have authority to enter the Holy of Holies, the holy place, Hebrews 10.19, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. That's where it is. The holy place is in the right hemisphere of the brain. And, and, and Hebrews 10.19 says you should enter there. Now, how do I know that the holy place is in the right hemisphere of the brain? Because in 1 Kings 6.8, when they constructed the temple, it says they put the door to the holy place or the middle chamber on the right side of the building. And the Apostle Paul says, you are the temple. So if you're the temple, the holy room or the holy place is on the right side of you or in the right hemisphere of your brain. And the Apostle Paul says, you have authority to enter there. And that's a place that Christians don't go. And if you tell them to activate the right hemisphere of the brain through meditation, they say you're a cult. But that's exactly what Jesus said, because he said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. And then Jesus said, if you want to catch fish, cast your net to the right side of the boat. That's what he was talking about. Okay? That means all you have to do is shut down those thoughts which are driving you nuts, hit the floor, kick your shoes off, go ohm, or whatever it takes to raise yourself up above the thoughts of the human mind and become free of them out there who are and who have been putting you on guilt trips and in fear all of your life, okay? So this is the inner kingdom. The things which remain, it says, are ready to die because I have not found you perfect. And the reason is you have not meditated. Now, you may have been a Christian all of your life. You may go to church all of your life. But what do you do if I say to you, Jesus Christ said, the first thing you should do is seek the kingdom of God which is within you. Have you done it? Have you sought within yourself for the kingdom of God? You say, no, I go to church. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't say go to church. He says, seek first the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God's within you. Have you done it? Jesus says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Have you ever practiced the single eye? You say, no. Well, then Jesus says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do? Where's perfection here? There is no perfection. 
The only way that you can attain perfection is when you lift yourself above the thoughts of your mind. Where there are no thoughts in your mind, your mind is virgin, it is pure, it is unstained by carnal thought, you have reached perfection. Now the pineal gland of the brain, it's pineal is also another word, is the single eye. Remember, and, and that's where Jesus said, that's the single eye. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. If you activate the pineal gland of the brain, you open up the right hemisphere. You're casting your net to the right side. And you remember in Genesis 32, 30, Jacob said, I have seen God face to face. He called the place pineal. Now you should know that because that's a brain, that's a gland right in the center of your brain and you've been going to church all your life and nobody's ever told you that that thing is there. Nobody ever told you there's a reference to it by Jesus and by Jacob as the place where you get a vision of God. I mean, I'm not making this up. Here it is. Genesis 32, 30. You look it up. Genesis 32, 30 is the pineal gland and in Matthew uh, 6, 22 is the single eye. Jesus said it. There it is. They both are talking about the same thing, the single eye, the pineal gland of the brain. Look up pineal, pineal in the, bi in, in the dictionary. It's a, it's a vestige. It was called the third eye, the single eye, the seat of the soul. You can look up in a, in a medical dictionary and say people don't even know it's what it is. Doctors don't even know what it's for. But Jacob said back 4,000 years ago, it's, it's the reason it's there so you can see God. If you have the, the organ in your brain which you can activate to see God, don't you think it'd be worth your while to try it? Oh, but they say, oh, now wait a minute, you're gonna get these people, they're gonna be into meditation, they're gonna open their eyes, they're gonna open their minds to demons. Did you ever hear that nonsense that Christians throw at you? Let me tell you something. The reason they say that is because they really don't trust Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said this, if you ask your father for a fish, he's not gonna send you a serpent. And Jesus Christ also said, at that day you will know I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. If he's in you, if God the Father's in you, if they're not going to fool you by sending you a serpent, why do you trust the people who warn you instead of the Christ who says the kingdom of God is within you? Seek it. Beyond me, but that's what we do. So here, let me see if we can finish this up really quick, because that's what we have to do. It says here, and this is very, very important. If your works are to be perfect so that your speech out of that which is Sardis or the throat chakra is of God, it must be done in meditation. See? Because the things are getting ready to die means it's simply that you have no way of understanding the physical things of God. You have no way of understanding that all of this is part of your mind, all of this is part of your, your, your psyche, all of this is part of your personality, but actually the flicker of flame that is left in there is going to burn out completely unless you listen to somebody and obey Jesus Christ and enter within so that you can come to life. Okay? And that's very, 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 very important. But when you get people in churches and religions, they don't want to hear about this. They don't want to hear about this. They want to continue their religious experience like it's always been, and yet look at the world. Look at the mess. Look at the wars. Look at the fighting. Look at the people dying with AIDS. Look at the abortions. Look at the, look at the bombs that have been dropped on people. Look at the children in Africa starving to death. Look, look, look at the violence on the streets. Look at the teenage suicides. Look at the drug addiction. Hospitals, jails, insane asylums are filled and everybody thinks, oh, and they're in church saying hallelujah. Hallelujah. For what? Hallelujah. God bless America. God bless America. You got a plagues in this country. All over the world. God, what would you do if he was mad at you? God bless America. Well, 